Good evening and welcome to Action News. My name is Katrina Bowman Thomas, Executive Director for Northern Kentucky Community Action Commission, and we are so glad that you have joined us on this evening. May is Community Action Month. There are over 1,100 community action agencies nationwide, and they all are here to make sure that we serve our communities to help families to thrive. One thing that we are known for is our Head Start program. We serve hundreds of young children to make sure that their needs are met and that they get to school on grade level. We also serve thousands of families, helping them to make sure that they have energy efficiency in their homes, that we help them with rental assistance, so again, families can thrive. That's what we do, and we celebrate that success all throughout the month of May. And so follow us on our Facebook page, Northern Kentucky Community Action Commission, to see all of the exciting things that we have planned for this month. On today's episode, you're going to hear about something that's very prevalent in today's society, the COVID-19 vaccine and the disparities that we have been experiencing. We're going to hear from some of our community partners that, that are going to talk about how to address those disparities, what they're doing right here in our communities to make sure that communities of colors get the vaccines that they need. May is also Older Americans Month, so you'll hear about our program, our Senior Employment Program, where we work with seniors to help retool them and make sure that they're ready to go back into the workforce. So stay tuned to learn more about Community Action and all of the wonderful services that we provide and to hear directly from our partners about the great things going on in our community. Hi, my name is Jameer Davis with NKCAC. And today I have the pleasure of having Stephanie Vogel with me um, from the Northern Kentucky Health Department and sh where she's the Director of Population Health. Thank you for being here, Stephanie. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we know that you could be a uh, hundred and one other places right now, but um, we're very grateful to have you here during the middle of a pandemic. So, well, thank, thank you. you. Thank yeah. you. It's nice to be here. How is the, how is the vaccination mm -hmm. uh, going, especially uh, in this region. How are we doing as a region? Sure. So we're doing pretty well. I think mm -hmm. we'd all like to do, you know, much better. Uh, in the last couple weeks, we've definitely seen the um, enrollment rate or, the, you know, folks registering for appointments slow down. Uh, we've made really good progress on those folks that want the vaccine and we're really interested in having it. And um, now we're ready to, to kind of get to the next level of folks who may have been putting it off because the vaccine was in such short supply and weren't able to get appointments. And um, so we've got about, according to our information, which we pull from the Kentucky Immunization Registry, we have about 43% of our residents vaccinated, uh, which is good, but we'd love to get higher. We really want to get to that point where we're reaching herd immunity. Um, the governor, of course, has a goal of 2.5 million people vaccinated so that then we can get back to more normal ways of operating um, like we were prior to the pandemic without having to wear masks and social distance and those types of things. So we're really doing our best to try to strive to get to that 2.5 million folks vaccinated. Right. Um, so things are going well. Uh, there's definitely more work to be done, more people to be vaccinated. Um, and more more efforts to kind of to dig in and do that. Absolutely. Have you noticed any disparities in the types of people mm -hmm. or age groups of people uh, that are being vaccinated and or not being vaccinated? Sure, that's a great question. Uh, you know, pretty early on, we realized that there were some disparities in the vaccination rates and those who were being vaccinated. And, um, you know, of course, some of that has a little bit to do with how the vaccine was rolling out because it was in such, such short supply. They really focused on trying to, to prevent more hospitalizations from folks. And so they, they narrowed in and really uh, focused on those folks old, older than 70. And so, you know, for example, we've done a great job for our uh, seniors. Um, you know, we have more than 70 uh, 3% of those folks vaccinated. Uh, mm -hmm. It's great. And that so. number continues to, con to climb. Each week we see more and more folks vaccinated. So we're doing a really great job there. Um, where we noticed um, work early on where that we needed to focus on was really with some of our populations that were African American, um, Hispanic, um, folks that are tend to be lower income. And um, 
So we've done a lot of work. We have some work groups that are meeting and developing strategy and communication methods so that we can get information out to help reduce what we call vaccine hesitancy, folks who may not uh, be interested in the vaccine for various reasons. Um, and so those groups are really focusing in on that vaccine hesitancy, the communication, how can we get more information out to people so that they have accurate and timely information. Mm -hmm. And then they're also developing uh, strategies on how do we get out into the community and how do we vaccinate in places to make it easier for folks. And we have work groups working on all three of those particular populations, uh, African-American, Hispanic, and our low-income folks. And some of those cross over to, um, you know, for, for the work that's being done and the communication strategies. Uh, but we're really trying to uh, understand the population, understand um, what we need to do to make those numbers higher. Uh, we've seen a, a great amount of success in the last couple months and really having those work groups focused on it. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's been really good to see. They're def the numbers are definitely not where we want them to be or not as high as uh, the general population, but without the efforts of these work groups, I, I do think um, well, we wouldn't be where we are today. That's great. Well, thank you so much for the work that you do in the community um, and doing your job to keep us safe. We really appreciate it here at NKCAC. Why don't you just tell the viewers if uh, they want to be in contact um, to get vaccinated or to get more information about health services, uh, where they can find that information. Sure. So uh, we have obviously a phone number um, and that phone number is 341-4264. Again, that's 341-4264. And that number will get you to a main uh, number that then you can be redirected to information about the vaccine. You can also check our website, which is nkyhealth.org, O-R-G. Um, again, nkyhealth, period, O-R-G. Um, and we have a COVID vaccine page on the website, along with all of our other information about the health department services. But that's a great place to see upcoming clinics for the week, whether it's with us or another provider. and. Um, we also have the traditional uh, Facebook and Twitter pages as well that folks could follow us on to get information. And we frequently post information just about COVID in general, COVID vaccine sites that have openings. Um, so those are, those are probably the, the easiest way and the quickest way to get the information. Thank you so much, You're Stephanie. Thank Stephanie you. Vogel with uh, the Northern Kentucky Health Department. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. We are so excited to announce our first annual gala, Hope Blooms, presented by St. Elizabeth Healthcare Center. This is going to be an exciting event. Tickets are still available. Our virtual tickets are available if you go to our website, www.nkcac.org. We're going to have so many interesting performers. We have American Idol winner Jada Blink. We have a local violinist. We have one of my good friends, Rhonda Whitaker Hurt, that will be our honorary chair. So come engage with us, take part in our first annual gala. My name is Kareem Simpson. I'm the manager of operations here at NKCAC. And joining us today is Dr. In uh, Aliyu Anyasi, the Associate Vice President of Diversity and Inclusion at, at um, St. Elizabeth Hospital. Thank you so much for joining us today. So um, thank you very much, Kareem. Um, a disclaimer, I'm not a doctor yet. Wait three more years, you call me a doctor. Gotcha, okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually in the NKU um, doctorate program, the EDD program, so I'm you wait three more years. I'm speaking into existence, so right. we're, thank we're talking, you. <laughs> there we go. Um, we just mentioned a little bit how much um, St. Elizabeth ha is a longtime community partner and is really entrenched in the Northern Kentucky uh, community. In recent years, what are some of the ways that St. Elizabeth has been helping out the region's health? So it is important for St. Elizabeth, when we look at our community, when we look at um, how we provide services, we understand that not every person in our community access health care the same way. Mm -hmm. And in that way, we have to make sure that we have to make sure our health, the health care that we provide is unique and targeted to the individual. Because we want to make sure that we don't put people in one bucket. 
to say all these community people need the same type of health care. So we have to make sure, Kareem, you are unique. You are a different person. And so we have to make sure that we tailor the care that you need based on what is happening to you. But we're not going to make sure, we're not going to categorize and say Kareem is African American, so African Americans need to access healthcare this way. And that's what we want to change. Health, the reason why we have health and healthcare disparities is because people are put into one bucket. And we want to change that. We want to make sure that whoever comes into St. Elizabeth for care, we provide you the care that you need, the care that is basic, that's unique to what you want. And so one of the things that is major here in uh, Northern Kentucky is battling social determinants of health as one of the strategies to, um, to, to help the health of the region. What is uh, St. Elizabeth doing in, to fight, um, to mitigate those social determin determinants of health to kind of help create a healthier region? So one of the things that we have to look at is as an organization, as the person that leads diversity, equity, and inclusion for St. Elizabeth, one of the, my focus and one of our focus is to look at how does our workforce look like? Does our workforce actually mirror the communities that we serve? So we want to make sure that we not only bring diversity into our workforce, but we are also able to provide our clinical teams, our providers, the tools necessary to serve every person. In, um, because in many cases, a lot of organizations would always say that we provide equal access to healthcare, but equal access does not equal equitable care. And we want to make sure that we provide that health equity to every individual. So that talks about our patients. But again, we're now dealing with a community. In this community that is so diverse is where we find these healthcare disparities. And so we conduct every two years, we have what we call community needs health assessment. And what we do with that community health needs assessment is we survey individuals in the community, um, various demographics, so they can tell us what are the challenges that they're facing in, in accessing healthcare. What are those roadblocks so that we can develop a strategy that would make sure that we are able to address these problems that these committee members have. And so when we talk about, um, going back to your question, what we want to be able to do is to make sure that we do the community needs health assessment reports that would tell us every demographic in this Northern Kentucky region. We have African Americans, we have Latinos, we have LGBT members, and all these communities have challenges in the way they access care. Yeah. And COVID-19 actually revealed so many things that we have always talked about. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at what COVID, the impact of COVID-19 in our community, African Americans, Latinos, LGBT, all those members of those communities, the underserved, low income, these are people that have faced so, much, so many challenges. What we did at St. Elizabeth to make sure that we mitigate these issues and the impact is we started collecting and looking at the data that we collect, which demographics have been impacted more. Mm -hmm. St. Elizabeth has been doing great work in the community and as a community partner I know you've helped us at NKCAC in many different ways as um, on our Black History Walk to our Implicit Bias Symposium and even um, in our upcoming gala. Um, what other ways are um, not specifically within health but what other ways is St. Elizabeth helping out in the community um, on the, at, in that level? So one of the things that I always care a lot about, I care a lot about our young people. We know we have a history. We have, uh, especially a black person like me, even though I came here to an, oh, a little over 20 years ago to the United States as an immigrant where I came here for school, I realized that we as black people, regardless of where you were born, we are impacted by slavery. And um, that continued to impact the way we access housing, education, healthcare, jobs, and all those kind of things. So one of the things that I'm very interested in, and that is the work that St. Elizabeth um, began to do, is how do we make sure that the young talent, the young people that we have, are prepared, are well-educated. And so even when we talk about healthcare, if we want to eliminate 
these health and healthcare disparities, we need to get more black people. We need to get more young black men and women educated and interested in these healthcare fields. So one of the things that we are doing, and we actually um, partnering with Kenton County, with um, Judge, Executive Judge um, Chris Knuckleman's team, and what we provided a grant, and one of those grants is going to help our young people. We're going to work with about 50 young people this coming year, um, beginning actually this um, summer, and these young people are going to go through a school year program. So we start with ninth graders, and we're going to go with these ninth graders all the way to 12th grade, getting them exposed to healthcare fields. And then next year, we'll recruit another group of young people that are going to be in ninth grade again. So this ninth grade is going to be in 10th grade, and we have another ninth graders going with us. But this is the way, so that when they get to 12th grade and they graduate, hopefully some, some of these young people are going to say, wow, I am going to go to school for healthcare, either public health, nursing, medicine, whatsoever. And our hope is these young people, after education, would come back to this community, probably come work for St. Elizabeth. And now they're going to be the individuals that are going to care for their parents. And so when we talk about those disparities, those kids now know who they are, know where they come from, know the history, and they'll be able to care for their family members better and, and, and in a, a way that we will be able to close that health care gap. I want to thank you so much for providing so much great information and talking with me uh, today, and hopefully we'll be talking to you soon. My name is Mike Miser, and I'm the Pro Fatherhood Program Manager for NKCAC. May, in addition to being Community Action Month, is also Older Americans Month. So we have joining us today Ms. Dina Shea from NKCAC's Senior Employment Program. Dina, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So let's start by just giving us a, a brief program overview of what the Senior Employment Program is. Uh, the Senior Pro Employment Program is for uh, 50 adults 55 or older that are lo looking for permanent work, can be part-time or full-time, mm -hmm. but they need to want to find a job. Okay. Uh, during this training program, they uh, can utilize job-seeking activities while they are training at a host agency site which are usually nonprofit or government agencies. Okay, great. So how did you personally find out about the program? I found out about the program when I first moved uh, to Covington. Um, I went to the Career Center because I had had a lapse in my employment history and I wanted some advice on uh, how to redo a resume with a gap. Okay. And so when I was in there redoing the resume, they um, asked me if I knew about the Kentucky uh, Senior Employment Program. And I said, no, I'd never heard of it. So that's how I found out about it. And uh, I went right there from the Career Center and I'm so glad I did. Nice, that's so great to hear. Can you give me an example or two of how the program has been just really beneficial to you as an individual? It has. Um, the main thing I can say that it gave me back the confidence I needed. Uh, when you're out of work for two or three years and sure. you've sent out application after application, resume after resume, mm -hmm. Uh, it wears on you and you start losing that confidence. You don't think, oh, I don't have it anymore. I can't yeah. do it anymore. And this program has really helped me get my confidence back. It's also helped me with uh, upgrading and learning new computer skills. Okay. Uh, and like I said, this program is the best thing that ever happened to me. Oh, I love to hear that so yeah. much. Um, so let's switch gears a little bit and tell me what a typical day might look like in the life of a program participant. Well, the participants uh, at the nonprofit or government agency, they usually do receptionist work. Mm -hmm. They can do uh, clerical work, uh, maybe data entry. Mm -hmm. uh, and also they d can do uh, janitorial or building maintenance. Um, that's usually basically uh, a day for a, okay. a participant. And it would depend on uh, what the participant had put in their application that they would like to do. Maybe they want to keep doing the same thing they had been doing. Sure. Or maybe they wanted to, they want to switch gears. Maybe somebody, I can't stand up like I used to, so I really need a job that I can sit down. That's basically what we try to do. So Fill lots those. of different options for, oh, yes. great. That's Definitely. really good to know. Um, and if you're willing, can you share a little bit with us about what your day-to-day 
looks like? Uh, well, basically I start, one of the, my major roles right now in the job is I'm doing enrollments. So any calls that come in for new participants, or mm -hmm. participants, people that want to be a participant. Mm -hmm. And I answer all their questions, usually then we'll uh, email or mail out our pre-application and questionnaire. When they come back in, then I get in contact with them again and we set up uh, what's an intake and orientation and we go through all the paperwork that's involved and then ex and explain the program to them through the, the orientation in more depth. Wow, that sounds like a wonderful process. Then I answer all uh, questions that the staff at the CSEP office has, okay. uh, any any problems or anything like that, I try to field those. Okay, great. Uh, so you mentioned earlier that you've learned some new computer skills. Mm -hmm. Can you expound on that a little bit? Uh, well, the CSEP program helped me out a lot uh, a while back, and they uh, did an Excel class that okay. they, they paid for. Uh, but it has helped me recently. I have learned to do more and more. It's like when you're doing the class, it's it's not really hands-on. Okay. And so I have really uh, learned a lot just hands-on. And the director of the program, Brandon Relliford, is the most patient person, and he can explain things and, and help you out the most of any one person I've ever known. Oh, good to hear, good to hear. Now, you've mentioned the acronym CSEP a couple of times. Yes. Okay, so Senior Community, Community Services, Services Employment, Employment Program. Program. Correct, very good. yes. Very good, thank you. Um, so let's say that, you know, you have a friend out there who's 55 or older, seeking employment, um, having a hard time finding it, what's the best advice that you could, could give to them about this program? The best advice is to call us right away. Okay. Uh, that we could really help them find a job that, that they want and that it's a no-brainer, really, because you're getting training skills and you're getting paid for it. Now, it's a stipend amount, but you're still getting paid. Where can you go and train for something and be paid for it. Right, yeah. right. Um, and then if you, you know, say someone is maybe having some, has some pause about enrolling in a, a government funded program like the Senior Employment Program, um, is there anything that you'd like to say to them to help maybe put their mind at ease? Well, I really want to know why they were so reluctant to be in the program, but the only thing I could say is, like I just uh, said a, a minute ago, I'll reiterate it, I can't understand why anybody wouldn't want to uh, learn new skills, upgrade their skills, and be paid in the process. And also, that organization is trying to help you find a job. Right. That makes a lot of sense. Yes. Um, do you have any contact information available for anyone who might be interested in the program? Uh, yes, they can call our main off our office uh, on it's at uh, 13 West 7th Street mm -hmm. in Covington. Uh, we will be moving some at some point later in the summer. Okay. Uh, but they can contact the phone number is area code 859-655-2986. Great. Okay. Thank you so much Thank for you. joining us, Dana. Thank you for having me. We'll be right back. Welcome back, and we hope that you enjoyed our show. We want to thank our community partners for all the wealth of information they shared. We're so glad to hear about the health department and all the efforts that they're making to make sure that our communities are vaccinated. We want to thank our partners at St. Elizabeth for all that they're doing in the community to really make sure that our care is individualized. And of course, I have to thank Dane, Dina and everything that she's doing with our senior employment program. Seniors are so important. They are the backbone of our program. I hope that you enjoyed our show. Remember, May is Community Action Month. Go to our website, get engaged with us over this month, and just help us to celebrate all the work that we do in the community and all of our community partners. And remember our gala, it's May the 14th. You can still get your virtual tickets. We hope to see you there. And tune in next time. Community Action, Action News is here just for you.